Okay, I just give, give uh, some push for, for the OTP24 release that is coming in May. Uh, you see here that, that we have already released a uh, release candidate in February and we will release a, a candidate in March in two weeks from now and another one in April and then the final release is planned for May 12th. And uh, I encourage you to, to test and give us feedback on these release candidates and report uh, any problems you have in, in the GitHub issues. And uh, as you know, the, the theme of this OTP24 is ease of use. We have a number of features that should make it easier to use for you. And of course, we also have some performance and other improvements as well. I will show some things that I want you to to test. It's the just-in-time compiler support. It's only supported for x86, 64-bit. And it requires that you have a build environment with a C++17 compiler. And you have that in GCC 7.5 or later. And if you are unsure if, if you got the git build, you uh, can test with the function airline system info emu flavor and you should get the result git if you have a git git and and you will also see it in, in the header of the airline shell when it comes up so please try that and it's uh, interesting to see what kind of performance you get because we expect uh, a speed up of up to two two times for depending on what you are doing in your code. I mean, between one and two times. So please give us feedback on that. Then we have the, the VX, the bindings for VX widgets. It has been completely rewritten in order to use the new, uh, the VX widgets version three as its base. Uh, the, it means that you have a new dependency to, to VX widgets version three instead of uh, you could uh, use an older version of VX widgets before when you build airline. It's also added support for VX web views so you can have HTML pages handled in, in the GUI. And VX is used in the observer application and the debugger and the crash time viewer. Uh, another feature that you can look at is when you get some uh, an exception from a built-in function, you until now, until before OTP24, you only get bad argument or bad arg and uh, nothing telling you what's wrong with the argument or if if the bif has more than one argument it doesn't tell what the argument is the bad one so now you can see in in below here that uh, now we are giving information about which argument was the bad one and what what's wrong with it Also, a new thing here is that the compiler is now giving column positions for errors and warnings. You can see it here. So 13 is line number 13 and 10 is, is the column number. And also the printouts from the compiler, which show with a marker where, where the error is. And other things that you could test as well is, for example, to use the GenTCP over socket NIFS. That's a, it was available in OTP23 as well, but now it has been uh, worked over so that GenTCP should be as compatible as possible with uh, GenTCP over the INET driver instead of sockets. 
also have support in TLS for early data that could uh, uh, bring quicker handshakes. You can try that as well. And eDoc application for generating documentation from the source code. It has been put, got new functionality for generating so-called duck chunks that you can use for getting uh, help in the Alang shell, for example. And as you can see here, the pull requests, actually contributions, are increasing over the years. So we thank you very much for all the contributions. It's good that the, it's showing that the activity is increasing and that's very good. Okay, that's all. I'm going to present. Now we can go to the questions. Right, this was very useful. Thank you. Lots of good highlights there. Um, we have interesting question posted by uh, Dayanand Sharma. Will you try to unmute yourself, please, and yeah. uh, join us here? Ah, uh, yes. So. Um, uh, coming from the object-oriented world and uh, writing uh, many multi-threaded applications, it is it's still very hard for me to wrap my head around the idea of processes uh, uh, and, and, and I understand that they're very you know cheap and all that stuff. But to me, the biggest question is that uh, because it's an extra model, there is a mailbox and all that stuff, when should I think about spawning a process? And of course, the obvious answer is, well, when you want to parallelize anything, but there are pros and cons analysis that I need to do. Like if I go on a spree of just spawning, you know, processes without thinking, I can, you know, create a, a bottleneck of sorts somewhere, right? That, that, that just one piece. And then the other piece related to that is the, the supervision of it. Like what strategies to use and when not to use and all that stuff. So there is a, I, to me, it feels like I, I don't either have the concept, you know, clear in my head, or there is a better documentation or a better book I need to read about it. So please help me. Okay, who shall give the answer? <laughs> can help each other, perhaps. Yes, uh, I can start. So. Uh, when I spawning processes and such things, it's kind of it's part of the the not so helpful question is that it's part of an intuition that you get when you use the language more. I will give you more help on this, but it's kind of you have to make trade-offs as you would in other languages. When should you create a new class? When should we incorporate into another one and so on? Uh, there's no simple answer. Uh, as you say, for parallelization purposes, when you need to parallelize something, you need to have concurrent entities in order to parallelize some kind of job for performance reasons uh, and so on. But if performance reason was the only reason that you wanted to create processes, then you, Erlang and OTP would not be the way it is today. So another reason for creating a process in, is in order to create kind of a <coughs> separate fault tolerant entity. So when a fault happens within one kind of entity, you isolate the fault within that entity so that you know that, okay, so this is the functionality that will be affected by a crash. And I think for me, those are the two main reasons uh, in order to split things up into two kind of different uh, processes. So for fault isolation and in order for parallelism in order to uh, get more performance out of the system. Uh, I mean, Alang is is built to 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 or created to build uh, telecom or complex control systems. So I mean, the the typical thing is that you model the the items as processes if they have a individual. Uh, events to handle. For example, model a, in a telecom system, you can model a subscriber as a process or a, or a mobile phone as a process. 
or things like that, because they are natural entities uh, with a parallel life, so to say. And the same if you simulate things, you can model people or cars as processes with their own lives and so on. And that's one way of thinking about processes. And of course, then you can have central processes, which are keeping, uh, I mean, providing some service to all the other so, uh, processes. Right, and uh, so, right, so that other services is the inter-process inter communication of sorts that you may want to, you know, do, but um, there's also the related piece of is the strategies that I need to choose to supervise or restart. Right. So, would you speak a bit about those strategies? Um, oh, nice. yeah. uh, so, the supervision strategies, I think neither me nor Kenneth is really an expert on this subject matter. Uh, there uh, it should have been one of our other colleagues that uh, should get this answer. And I'm I'm pretty sure that there are people in this audience that know this better than us anyway. Uh, so I don't think that I have, without looking in the documentation and checking things, any a good answer for you uh, on that. Do you have anything that you would like to add, Kenneth? No, I mean, it's the same for me that I have to... I, I don't know en enough by heart. I have to look in the documentation to what what's the name of all these uh, supervisor types actually so and then maybe as you can see then not even us that I, i've been working with alan for 15 years and kenneth for 25 we don't know these things by heart so it's uh, it's uh, it's not the type of thing that you do very often i would say but uh, when you're starting to get the system up and running you do it but when you're maintaining a system like we do it's very rare that you are actually creating supervision hierarchies and so on uh, there. So we don't get a lot of exposure to those primitives in our daily day-to-day -day work because we're, we're maintaining and creating some small new features. We're not creating new big applications. Me or Kenneth personally, there are people at the OTP team that are here, but not us personally. All right. right. Thank you. Okay, so I think the, the I think for me the missing piece is still the the mailbox we can become a potential you know bottleneck if 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 you're relying on that one you know uh, you know one gen server as, as an example. So what are the what is the thinking behind like things that you can avoid creating these bottlenecks? The classical approaches is either using kind of some kind of ETS table to, uh, in order to parallelize access to the state so that you work through that instead, uh, trying to get the parallelization of your system through an ETS table, or if you need to have the processes because it's doing some kind of complex uh, computations on each message or something like that, then you need to find some way to split your things as you would do with a uh, like a distributed database or something, you need to find some way to split your state so you don't get these huge processes with states. It's the same kind of thinking. You need to either do, I mean, do some consistent hashing <laughs> across processes or something like that in order to spread the load. Because if you have a single process that does heavy computations and then you have one, it can only run at one time. And then if you have 24 others cores, constantly banging it with messages, your system will fail. So you kind of have to take a step back and think, how do, how would I solve this kind of in a distributed environment to see how would I solve this if I have network, or if that's a more familiar problem for you to solve, how would I solve this? And then you shrink it down into Erlang and say, okay, so I think about these processes as separate entities in a network instead. And what tools would I use to solve that? And then use the same tools to solve the same problem with an airline. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas and Kenneth. Okay. And thank you, Daya, for great questions. The, there are lots of uh, other resources that maybe you can uh, refer to, lots of books that the, the airline documentation recommends on the front page. 
uh, which could be also a good follow up to those answers. Thank you. We need to move on to the next question. We have lots of them posted here. I will ask now maybe Brujo. Brujo, can you join us here on the stage and ask your yeah. question? Hopefully you yeah. will regret this one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure I will, but, uh, but still I want to know the answer. So there are at least three formatters going around. Steamroller is may, it's maybe not so much popular these days, but it's uh, the one that we created at uh, Next Rule and the one that was created by WhatsApp. So is there going? Is there any plans to make one of them, you know, the official one, incorporated to the Erlang organization in GitHub like it was with River? And if it's uh, LFMT, will you also adopt their syntax tools, their parsing and whatever, and ditching the the ones that are currently in OTP, like our parse, our syntax, our pretty PR or whatever? Um, the first thing we plan to do is to to evaluate the URL FMT uh, for the OTP code and, and see if we can come to the conclusion that we want to use uh, that one or another formatter. There are several different opinions in, within the team about formatters. Very strong opinions that are in yes. different directions. That's everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> mm. so, so so that's the that's the first uh, uh, way. I have started to look at it, at the, and uh, we will have some feedback to the WhatsApp team about things that we absolutely don't like in that case, uh, and see if they can be fixed. Uh, and then we have to decide if we should do something about the OTP code base. Um, and that's the, the first step. And th then I haven't done more thinking about it actually right now. But if we do something more, then, then I think maybe the, the other tools in the OTP should be in line with the format. Uh, all right, thank you. We have another very popular question uh, from Roman Rabinovich. Roman, can you join us here? If not, I will read it out. Mm, so the question was, what major changes occurred in OTP over the past decade and what were the driving forces The last decade. Okay. Uh, now we have to remember something. Yeah, so well, maybe I mean, what what are the motivations? What are the driving forces? What makes you decide that this next release will be focused on ease of use or other things? How, how do you decide about stuff? It's uh, driven by uh, our internal customers uh, inside Ericsson because they are paying for 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 us. <laughs> So that's uh, trial one. Then we have the open source community because we want to be popular in the open source community as well. And it's good to have many users. So that's the, the second one. And uh, then it's our own ideas. Sometimes we, we uh, find out ourselves what the Ericsson customers need. And uh, that's, uh, I mean, for example, there has been many things about uh, performance and scalability over many cores driven by Ericsson customers. Uh, there is uh, things about the SSL application and TLS protocols that's driven by Ericsson customers. Uh, what more profiling tools? I would say like uh, language features and such things are mostly driven from the open source community, not so much from Ericsson. Eric, the Ericsson part is very practical. We want to solve this problem while the open source is more, I don't know, philosophical or something like that. So like the maps, introduction of maps in, what was it 2015 or something was initiated from an open source yeah. while we 
took an EEP that was submitted and then we massaged that a bit and put it in uh, our release. So there's, uh, and quite often, I think we find that things that would, we find things that are requested by the open source community that we know will benefit, that Ericsson will want to have in the future, but maybe haven't realized yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have Bruno Haas with us, and he has a very interesting question. I think it would be for you, Lucas. Bruno, can you join us? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yep, hello. Okay, so my question is about the, the new JIT compiler. Uh, from the JIT compilers I'm familiar with, like the one in Java or JavaScript, usually the compilation happens gradually like the code gets profiled and you just compile to native code the the parts that are hot. For me, it looks like this is different in the Erlang compiler, like you compile everything to native code from the start. Uh, how is that different in Erlang? Uh, yes, uh, well, as you described, it, it is different. And I, I like to kind of uh, describe our JIT as a compiler, JIT just a time compiler without optimizations. So it, it, normally, almost always, when you think about a just in time compiler, you also think about something that does optimizations while it's doing the compilation. It's quite normal for a compiler to do that, uh, to do optimizations. And we do do some small, small optimizations uh, in there, but not nothing like the V8 or the JVM hotspot or something like that. We do do small things uh, there. I, I debated uh, when deleting the thing, I was be calling it the just in time compiler because it's really on the edge of not being a just in time compiler. But in the end, I kind of decided yes, it is a just in time compiler, but it's kind of debating the meaning of what the just in time compiler is and is not. I don't know, it's not that important to me. Uh, there and I think we will try to make it more in the future, just in time optimization parts. But at the moment, we got all the uh, performance benefits we wanted with an initial release by just doing a very simple compiler, or even a transpiler, want to call it. Uh, there. Thank you. No problem. Excellent. Thank you. I, I can can I can I just come in with a quick question? Sorry. Um, yes. Robert. Is, is, with the compiler, is the JIT done at compile time or at load time? At load time. Okay. So the compiler generates normal normal beam code. Yes. Right. Uh, okay. So the just in time compiler can consume beam code compiled with a system that does not support just-in-time compilation. So you can compile with OTP21, your Alan code, and then it will be loaded into OTP24 and just-in-time compiled. So everything is done just-in-time, which is why it's just-in-time. So oh, okay. when you're loading it, it gets done. So it's the exact okay. same beam format. We haven't changed that at all. Uh, okay, so I don't, when I'm compiling my beam code, I don't have to know who is going to load it. I still don't have to know who's going to load it. No, if it's there. and it's the same code and it's not duplicated. So the size doesn't increase and mm -hmm. so on uh, there. And that's kind of one of the major differences between hype and the uh, just in time compiler now that hype did the ahead of time compile compilation into the beam files while we in the just-in-time compiler load the beam code into memory and do the translation on the fly. Okay, great, thank you. Good, yes, thanks, thank you. Thanks, Robert. Yeah, now I'm done. That was a very, very good question. Very good to clarify this one. Uh, Anatoly, would you like to go next? Yes, thank you. Uh, my question is a really simple one. I. <laughs> You mentioned that uh, GAN TCP compile, uh, GAN TCP uh, will be on already on using uh, socket MIF. Uh, what about GAN UDP? We'll use uh, the same MIF or it will be stay as it was. 
Yeah, UDP will will use will we'll use, but it's it, not uh, implemented yet. Oh, it will, but not in twenty four, right? No. Okay, thank you. Because I have to do this somehow myself, and it gave, and I got a great, at least thirty percent increase, maybe even more, when you. <clears throat> So cool. please do it. Thank you. It is, it is in the plans to do it. We are the, the reason. Uh, I will be waiting. So I think that maybe I'm going to explain some of the reasoning. So we want to move away from all of our old INET driver code and remove that from the virtual machine completely. So we need to kind of convert all of our uh, INET APIs, so uh, the TCP, SCTP, and UDP to use the socket MIF. So the goal is that we will remove the backwards compatibility then with the INET driver completely from the emulator. But this is kind of a OTP, I don't know, 28 or something in the future, uh, a couple of years still before we can do that. And before that, uh, the people will be still like a driver, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you again. I will be waiting. Excellent. Good. Uh, next uh, question is from Marcel. Marcel, are you with us? I'm here. Yeah. Hello. Hey. Uh, I have a question regarding. Um, um, yeah, a statement I heard from Kenneth. Uh, I think two or three years ago about uh, gRPC. So um, I am in an environment that we we very much like gRPC to interact with other uh, components. And I just wanted to ask if um, if there is some work going on to support that. I think it was, it was mentioned also with MQTT and other uh, protocols that could be supported by the platform. Thank you. Um. We have no ongoing work with gRPC or, or MQTT in, in the OTP team, actually. I mean, gRPC is, uh, there are third party components which support that, uh, which some of our customers are using, but we don't develop it ourselves. The same goes for MQTT. Uh, may, maybe the, the closest support for MQTT is that we are developing but have not finished uh, maybe the DTLS support, which might be used in, in that area. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. Uh, we have a very interesting question from Brandon Gottlob. Brandon, can you go? If not, I'm going to just read it out because it's a very good one. Are there any specific areas where the OTP team is looking for help from individual contributors? I don't know if it's a special areas uh, that we have uh, in mind. Maybe it's more general. Depends on what the, what the skills of the person is, what, what the competence area of the person is. They can suggest what to engage in. I have a very boring answer to that. The best place personally that I would see contributions coming into is the documentation. It's the best place where somebody outside can help us make things clearer because we are so much in the zone that we don't understand what's obvious and what's not obvious. So helping out with writing documentation, asking about details in the documentation that you don't understand so that we know which things need to be clearer. Those kinds of things, they help us to understand what's needed by somebody using our documentation and using our tools, adding features and so on. That's nice and all, but understanding how to use the features that we have and also discovering the features that we have in different ways is 
very hard to do correctly and do right. And a majority of the pull requests we get are code pull requests because that's kind of, that's, it's fun. I'm, hacking and doing things is fun. The hard work is making sure that documentation is correct and specific and easily understandable by everybody from beginner to expert. That's what I appreciate contributions the most. And it could also be good in the area of uh, tools helping with the uh, development and uh, things like that. Maybe it doesn't matter if they are inside OTP or if they are separate components, they are good for the community. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much for this one. And we have Brian now on the stage. What is your question? Hey. Yeah, so um, as part of the several of us on the teams of working around observability and the telemetry and such, um, the introdu introduction of the atomics um, was pretty helpful in the fact that we now have like effectively a mutable indexed array uh, to operate off of, uh, which was, you know, in my testing quite a bit faster than using X counters. Um, however, we're a little limited in the fact that it only, A, it is index based and the fact that it only supports integers. So the addition, potential addition of, you know, supporting floats as well, um, and even more helpfully, helpful would be the addition of um, keyed access um, uh, so that we have more of an associative array uh, that's mutable. Um, we're able to, you know, somewhat do this with integers by uh, creating a map that has a lookup to uh, the indexes, but we're, you know, have to manage multiple uh, data structures in that case. So just kind of a question of, has there been any consideration of expanding uh, the functionality of atomics? Um, and if not, um, are there any like limitations that were considered? I don't really remember if we've I, I, I remember the floating point thing coming up uh, in discussions before uh, there. I don't remember the reasons why we didn't uh, go forward with that. I don't think at the moment we don't have any plans to extend or change the Atomics API. Uh, but that does not mean that we could change our opinion about that uh, there. Uh, I would suggest opening up a to get the discussion going uh, there to see if there isn't one already. I, I don't remember if there is or if there isn't uh, uh, to see what we can do uh, regarding floats. The associative hash array thing, I think, will be a bit harder to convince us to include, but not impossible either. I don't know, uh, there, it, but the floats might be something that we can uh, do something about. Uh, the other part, I don't think, I think we want to try to keep that piece of code simple if we can. Uh, and this is, of course, things that you can write in your own NIFs for uh, to do if you need something like that. It doesn't have to be built into to be even if that is convenient, obviously. Uh, it's always have there. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, for my own NIFs, it would be, okay. I mean, if it was just for a particular company, I think it would be okay. But the fact that we're trying to like use these in support of the telemetry project and open telemetry and such, we shipping NIFs is just not a possibility. So, cool. Uh, I'll open up a, a issue if there's not one. We'll continue the discussion there. All right, and now we have a very good question from Nico. You're with us now, right? Um, so, hi, Lucas, and hi, Kenneth. So my question is pretty high level. So how easy or difficult is it to move from JavaScript, Node.js, to you know Elixir and OTP without prior knowledge of the Erlang language? <laughs> mm. 
I, I don't know is the answer. Uh, I know how difficult it will be. It's a different paradigm. It's a different way of thinking. But as with most things, you kind of, I, since I work with it, I believe the benefits outweigh the difficulty of getting into it because I've seen a lot of other people getting into Alang and uh, Elixir and so on, and they start to think about their JavaScript and Java code and so on in a different light after they've gone in through and looked at the way that fault tolerance and such are handled in the Alang Echo Foundation from this ecosystem uh, there for different parts. So I, how hard is a very tough thing to measure. Not too difficult, I would say, but it's uh, it has a lot of new concepts that you need to kind of understand and learn uh, in there. But it isn't harder to come that way than to come from any other language, uh, like from Java or C or C++. I don't think that's harder to come from JavaScript side. No. No, in, I think JavaScript is kind of, in some senses, closer to what Erlang does than what other languages do because of the event model and all of these things. So it's kind of, it's a bit similar if you squint your eyes a lot uh, there but compared to Java, I would say. But uh, I'm not really an expert in these languages, so I can't really compare uh, all that well. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I can make a comment here, and, I, and this will be actually wrapping up with a comment because we are running out of time here, Nico. But uh, I remember when I was learning Erlang myself, uh, there, are, there are a few things I had had to unlearn uh, from my previous programming languages. So, for example, how do you loop? Uh, there is no loop uh, construct, right? We have uh, recursive calls, and recursion was probably one of the toughest places uh, that I had to spend most of my learning uh, to get it right. And uh, maybe this shift of paradigm more towards functional programming, less so towards um, imperative programming. This is maybe a little bit of a challenge. It might be difficult at first. But otherwise, yeah, it's like as any other language study. You would just practice for examples, and uh, this will get you started. <laughs>